break into the Floss. Fixie Test Convention. PenguinCon 2015. It's a what is it? So it's not a testing framework, but it's a testing framework builder for .NET. Okay. So, and then I started my own, but it's just a small thing we use in my work. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just said, I think maybe yeah. other people might want to use this sometime. So I'm going to do it outside of work and just use it. Right, right, yeah. I'll be, I'll be talking about that kind of thing. Um, I've also got some, uh, some ribbon. Benevolent oh, wow. dictator ribbons for anyone who wants one. Nice. I'll take one, hand one. one of everything, anything you're handing out here. Yeah, and then I also have my, my Twitter ribbons. Thank you. I'll take one of those. <laughs> the bug reports are important. Oh, you know, you know they got, they're not doing pecan this yeah, year. Yeah, it's a pecan I saw after I ordered the ribbons. Oh, yeah, here you go. Oh, one of these. Just found my first bug last week. I think I can fix it. No one else has seen this spot yet, so I think oh, yeah. I'll get to submit it. Yeah, that's the pull request. That's nice when you you know you have your first uh, pull request, you yeah. know, accepted. Yeah, that is kind of cool. Yeah. Well, to me, it was just exciting to yeah. submit my first pull request. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I guess I will get started. So welcome to Leading uh, Floss Projects. Uh, I'm Ed Platt. Uh, I, this is my sixth PenguinCon, so I'm glad to be here. And uh, currently, I live in Boston. I work as a staff programmer at the Center for Civic Media at MIT. So I uh, lend software engineering support to students who are working on civic technology projects. Uh, before that, I lived uh, here in Michigan for about 40 years, uh, helped start the i3 Detroit hackerspace. And one of the things I worked on there was a uh, program called Seltzer CRM, uh, which is an open source member management uh, application. So I'll be talking about uh, leading open source projects through the lens of my experience on that project, uh, which is definitely a... Yeah, go ahead. And it's, it's definitely a small open source project, but we have a, a few few contributors. So um, uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about applies to smaller projects, like probably like the ones that you're more likely to start, uh, rather than something like Firefox or one of those giant open source projects. <laughs> so uh, I want to start with a quiz. Uh, does anyone know what the median number of developers is for an open source project? One. No, two. You were right the first time. Oh, really? <laughs> it's Median? One. Really? Median, yeah. So most open source projects um, never make it past the first developer. So community is not a requirement for open source. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe to be usefully open source. Um, but uh, but that, that was surprising to me when I originally learned it. But having gone through the experience of uh, building an a small, even a small open source community, um, it is no longer a surprise at all. So uh, a little background on Seltzer, uh, the, the application that I maintain. When i3 hit about 40 members, we realized that there was nobody who knew all of the members. So there wasn't one person we could ask and say, hey, you know, who, who is he, who is she? Or, you know, uh, do you know anyone who's interested in metalworking or anyone who can teach me to use the wood lathe? Um, so we needed uh, a way to keep track of that. Uh, and there were s systems like uh, Civi CRM, which uh, is a really uh, full-featured uh, contact man uh, relationship manager. Uh, it's used by a lot of nonprofits, uh, things like that. We tried to use it and we couldn't because it takes weeks to learn how to use it and when you're running on volunteers, uh, you, volunteer time is scarce and you don't have time to uh, you know, train a volunteer um, for several weeks and, and then retrain a new volunteer when they you know, get too busy to help out. So, so we set out to just create a really simple 
uh, really simple solution for tracking uh, hackerspace members. And that's where, that's where Seltzer came from. So originally, you know, it was just me. I was one of those uh, open source developers who had one member on the, on the project. And, you know, I built the kind of bare bones version of what we needed. And I deployed it and it worked for us. And I threw it up on GitHub and I was like, great, we've got an open source project, done. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I thought that it would just magically turn into, you know, people would start contributing <laughs> beautiful code. Um, you know, and I, I quickly learned that's not how it worked. Um, uh, I was excited because people did start actually contributing. Um, well, I, I should say people started forking the project and creating their own, you know, um, modifications and extensions. But how long after? Was it people like worked with your company or worked with the hackerspace or was it? It was uh, it was people from other hackerspaces. Oh, okay. uh, there's a lot of communication between hackerspaces and sharing of tools and and. Uh, Processes. So, um, you know, there were a few different uh, projects like this out there. Um, so, it, it was only a, a few months before you know somebody came across oh, cool. it and decided to give it a try. Uh, so, uh, so, so what happened um, was they said, "Well, this doesn't do everything I need it to do. So, I'll just you know start packing the code and make it work for me." Uh, of course, that immediately made it incompatible with the next version that I was working on. And now we had, rather than um, one open source project that doesn't do everything you need, we had two open source projects, neither of which do everything you need. Uh, so I realized that if I actually wanted to converge on something that was more useful to a larger number of people, I needed to actively manage the community. So at that point, uh, I, I rebooted. You know, first I start by saying, you know, what are these features that everyone else really needs, and they're trying to build for themselves before, uh, before even using the software. So I went back to look and see what people were doing, and I realized that the software wasn't mature enough for them to figure out this is the way to implement this type of feature. You know, so somebody wanted to do um, a more secure login form. And it was un unclear from the code how you should do that. So I uh, implemented some of those features myself that I could use it as examples and documented as I went kind of the, the systems that I was using. This is how you build a form. This is how you build a table. Uh, this is how you respond to submitted data. Uh, and those were things that I could refer people back to. So if they said, you know, I want to uh, implement this kind of login, like a Twitter login or something, I could say, well, here's an example of somebody who implemented another type of login. You can look at their code and see how they did it. So looking at things that are actually useful to people um, is a great way to figure out where to take that limited volunteer time and create examples. Uh, so solve problems that are going to be useful and that are also going to uh, be templates for future developers. Uh, another thing I did was start uh, weekly dev sessions. So there were people who were interested in the code, but we weren't talking to each other. So we started uh, meeting over Google Hangout uh, once a week, every Wednesday night. And that was a time, uh, originally we were writing code, uh, we were doing pure programming, uh, it wound up being a good time to do prioritization and accountability. So uh, it wasn't necessarily that we were writing a lot of code during those meetings, but we were saying, OK, what do we want to do? What do we need to do next? Who's going to do it? You know, who said they were going to do something last week, and how's it going? You know, it's, it's volunteer, so you're not going to like, you know, shake, shake your, wag your finger at somebody who isn't doing it. But, uh, uh, just knowing that that meeting's coming up can be a really good motivator for people. Uh, and we also did code reviews. Um, you know, one of the big challenges in an open source project is getting people familiar with the code base and uh, making sure that all of the developers have confidence in all of the areas that they need uh, to work on a program. So doing code reviews, one, you know, it's just a good practice to check bugs. Um, yeah. 
Two, it's a great way to get everyone familiar with the code base and with the technology that you're using. So we, we wound up doing a lot of code reviews um, during those uh, weekly dev sessions. And so it was like a community review? Yeah, exactly. Or it would be maybe like, one person showing the code and then another person, you know, saying the WTF. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then everyone else would be watching that yeah. and, you know. That was cool. Uh, yeah. So that worked very well. And of course, I also created a mailing list for the developers that we could use to talk to each other. Uh, and that was kind of a lower engagement step for people to get involved. Like maybe they didn't want to be in a certain place at a certain time and turn their webcam on, but uh, we got a lot of people saying, hey, I'd like this feature, can you do this? Or I'd like to build this. And we could then say, okay, like if you want to um, you know, add like open ID, uh, this is you know probably one of the approaches you want to think about taking. You know, we could have that discussion on the mailing list. Um, so the important thing was that we had a place for that discussion that was uh, that had a low enough barrier so that people would actually use it. So still, there are tons of people forking the code and creating incompatible forks that are you know good for their particular uh, needs. Um, and that's you know that's great. You know that's going to happen with any project. Um, but we also have people who are contributing back and communicating with us, um, and that's that's been uh, I think one of the uh, the markers of one of my markers of success for the project is we have people contributing back code that uh, they can work with each other. So um, when one person contributed to code that I had nothing to do with, and a person from a third group started using it. Like that was a big, um, you know, that was a big celebration for me because uh, because people weren't just hacking on something uh, for their own use. They were hacking on something in a way that would be um, shared with everyone, and and that's that's really the goal of open source, right? Yeah. And of course, uh, if you want everyone to be on the same page, like that documentation is important. Uh, I tried doing a lot of documentation. Um, it's never fun to write documentation. Turns out it's also never fun to read it, uh, well, for most people. Um, so even when there was documentation there, it often only wound up being useful for uh, referring people. Uh, so if somebody said, oh, I need to do this, but I don't know how to, how to do this, I could say, you know, check out the uh, check out the wiki page on the uh, forum submission subsystem, and I could send them a link to it. Uh, and then if they had questions, you know, I could add those back there. Um, so usually, it wasn't like somebody was reading the documentation and then saying, "Oh, okay, now I know how to do this." It was somebody asking me either on the mailing list or in person, um, and then saying, "You know, okay, I know, I know what you need. So you can find it here. Uh, it's online." Uh, one thing that was very useful was having a short list of kind of the design principles that we were using. Um, uh, a good example is don't hack core, which you know we stole from uh, Drupal. Um, you know, and the idea is rather than taking the core code and changing it to do what you want, you create a module that um, leaves the core code intact and allows people to um, yeah, and changes the behavior you want. And the great thing about that uh, is that everyone shares the core code and everyone can improve it together. But if people have different needs, they can maintain their own modules separately. So did you have to re-architect over time the, the system? Was it, was it or was it kind of fairly sensible in the beginning or did you kind of have to? It was, it was pretty sensible actually um, because it was based really heavily on Drupal. Okay. Um, and using Drupal. They have a good system. plugin system? Like yeah, they do. Extension um, system. It's, uh, it leads to a lot of stress and trouble, but it is like, it's really good for that. They have a healthy community of contributed plugins. Um, the, um, it, so I, I find too, like, your code structure usually goes hand in hand with how your team structure is. So it's like, if you want to get that, you know, sensible or, or easy to contribute, you know, you've got an architect, you can't just, they're not yeah. isolated from each other. 
Yeah, and I think, um, well, I am actually going to be doing some re-architecting this summer. Um, and I wish I had made it easier for people to create their own modules. Uh, because I started with a lot of built-in modules because I started on the features that m most people would want and it made sense to include them. Um, and I think that's one people, one reason people have been hacking core because they're all in the same repository. Yeah. Um, so if I could go back and do it again, what I would do is create a you know module installer and and put a bunch of modules in their own repositories. Um, and when I mm, gotcha. you know, work on the next version, that's probably what I'll do. Where that's kind of the default. So the only reason you're hacking core is if you want to change like how the you know foundation works. Um, which almost nobody really wants to do. I found that in my work, is yeah. that I'm the only one touching infrastructure code. Mm -hmm. Which That's is good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's probably good if um, you're the only one who's actually intentionally changing the infrastructure, right? <laughs> I want other people to be able to, right. is the thing, though. It's mm -hmm. like, I want them to get to a level of understanding where they can go and feel free to, to change the infrastructure if they want. This right. isn't open source, this is work, this right. is job. I mean, they're getting paid, to, so they should you know, do whatever they need to do. But yeah. it's still a rare thing if some, you know, to, for people to delve that deep into the bowels of the code and yeah. change it. Yeah, and keeping it in a separate repository, it's, uh, it's kind of like using sudo on the command line. Yeah. You know, like, right. you, have, you can have access to it, but you, you're kind of mentally aware that, you know, yeah. now you're doing something serious and mm -hmm. you need to be careful. Right. That, that's that right on. I think that's a great, great yeah. analogy. Uh, so after, after we started getting people contributing um, and participating in our calls, one of the things that happened was pull requests coming in out of the blue, uh, people who would maybe show up for one, you know, one meeting or another uh, and then kind of disappear. So we had to figure out how to integrate uh, code when the level of communication was kind of intermediate. You know, it wasn't just like nobody, like it wasn't just somebody like hacking and creating their own fork, um, but it wasn't somebody who had worked really closely with us either. So feature requests, how would you handle someone like that coming in and saying, hey, I want something. What, what techniques did you find helpful to manage, you know, intermittent, uh, as you say, contact? Yeah, uh, so that, that one's actually, uh, it was pretty easy for us. We'd uh, submit a user story issue on GitHub, uh, and the idea of a user story, uh, if any of you aren't familiar, is uh, basically saying uh, a user of this type wants to do this thing for this reason. You know, it's, it's three parts, so you keep in mind who actually is using the software for this what specifically they asked for and why they and then why they asked for it um, and those are all important things when implementing something so oftentimes we would take a feature request and kind of upgrade it into a user story and then we talk through in like one of the dev sessions for instance uh, is the implement implementation that they um, they suggested really what they want you know mm. we'd, we'd look back at yeah what they're trying to do and we'd say, is this the best way to do it? You know, is this a good way to do it? Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. Um, if it wasn't, we'd try to contact them and say, would this work for you? Um, oh, exactly what you mean. Right, because even if you give somebody a solution that you think is better, if they don't think it's better, they're not going to use it. <laughs> um, so it Oftentimes sense. you have to play translator between the big real business problem and yeah. they'll give you a solution, but not the actual problem. It's like, well, right. well, why? Why do you need a button here? Why exactly. Why? And you have to work backwards. And yeah. That's, I find it fun though. I yeah. Fun. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a huge part of, of software, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, why do so few of us do it then? <laughs> it seems. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a skill that, you know, you have to learn as a developer. It's not, and they don't really teach it in, you know, uh, programming they, books. They don't teach, yeah. That's a whole other topic. Yeah. Yeah. I'll save that for next year. So another related question is, is how to onboard new developers. So if somebody really wants to be involved, um, but you know, maybe they, well one, they aren't familiar with the code. Uh, two, 
maybe they are you know a really junior developer and they don't have the experience to just jump in and you know completely rewrite some core system on, on their own. Um, so we've we've kind of tried different things and I think uh, I've made plenty of mistakes that I've learned some lessons from. So mostly I'll be sharing lessons uh, that I that I have learned from and, and hope to um, do things better in the future. Um, one thing that's really important is to keep a balance of experience on your team. So you don't want one really experienced developer and a bunch of people who are writing their first code ever. Um, you also uh, don't want, um, you know, like everybody being super experienced and and turning and turn people away if they're new developers. So. You want a way to bring people who are available onto the project uh, and make use of what they have to offer and hopefully uh, give them a chance to learn and grow and improve through working on the project. Well, uh, just, uh, so that's only a good goal, so how do you achieve that? How do you yep. promote the right balance of people on the... Yep, so uh, that's a great question and things that I've looked at to do that are, again, peer programming. So. You can take someone who's a little more experienced and someone who's less experienced and put them together to work on the same project. Uh, either doing code reviews for each other or switching back and forth. So, so most of your code reviewing stuff is actually live in person? Because ours at work is like you kind of read it and you know, send them an instant message or something. Well, some of it's, uh, very little of it is, you know, physically in person. Oh, okay. Some of it is, um, some of it is, uh, welcome. Some of it is uh, uh, on the Google Hangout, so it's synchronous. Come over here. Yeah, feel free to come up to the. Yeah, some of it uh, is we did synchronously, kind of in the Google Hangouts. Okay. Uh, some of it was asynchronously. Someone would submit a pull request. Somebody would review it, leave a comment, and it would be a back and forth. Um, uh, I I found myself uh, in a situation where. We had a couple pretty strong developers, and we had a lot of people who wanted to help, um, but weren't really familiar with PHP, um, because PHP kind of has gone out of style at this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. So by the time the, the project was mature, um, the <laughs> uh, basically the people who, who were willing to jump into PHP didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> Because if you knew what you were doing, you didn't want to use PHP. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was uh, that. That's one reason that I'm architecting. Actually, is is uh, I mean, PHP has a lot of security problems. Oh, and, does it? Okay. Yeah, uh, and that's one thing that I'm uh, hoping to work around by re-architecting. But also just. Choosing a language that people use, like that's a real engineering. What, what is the seeming popular for? Because I'm in .NET land. Yeah, yeah. We open source is still kind of this mysterious land to a lot of us over there. Not yeah. to me, but to others. Right. Um, so there, there are a few different options, and I actually haven't decided on one yet. Um, I mean, a lot of people are using Python. A lot of people are Python. using Ruby. Um, yeah, Ruby would be yeah. the top. And then uh, JavaScript and Node yeah. are also really popular. That's probably what I'd lean towards, but uh, yeah. no one in much about it. Yeah, yeah. So what, what I'm trying to think about is not necessarily what's the most popular right now, but what is going to have the, the longest lifetime. You know, so what, yeah. what can we use that will have a good community support and a large volume of developers for the next decade. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. And I don't know what the answer is yet, but... If we knew, you yeah. know, we'd probably all be already flocking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like I said, uh, peer, uh, peer pair programming, uh, code reviews are a good way to... Oh, can I add something, too? Yeah. Pair programming, too, if you're going to utilize it, what we found is that have your junior developer drive most of the time. Mm -hmm. That's actually way more powerful than if, if the... If, if the if the, the inexperienced guy is watching the experienced guy code, or girl, um, then you, they don't get nearly as much out of it as if the experienced person is watching the inexperienced person code. Yep. It's actually a lot more yeah. powerful because you can kind of guide them as they go along. 
Although I'm gonna tell you, sometimes this kid is boring. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. sitting there <laughs> waiting for them to realize what they're. <laughs> you, you, can, you know the solution, but it's yeah, yeah, no, and yeah, it, it does. does. Totally, it really does. You're totally right. Um, and it, the interesting thing is, uh, experience. If you're a really experienced developer, uh, sometimes that is a liability. You know, sometimes there's something that's obvious to you that is not obvious to most people in the universe. Yeah. Um, and uh, pair programming with someone who's uh, less experienced can actually help you remember those assumptions that you've forgotten about uh, and write better code that's for it. Really yeah. uh, and that's you know something that surprised me when we started doing this. So I've got a real beginner question yeah. for this topic, and that's: Was there a point between having released this project mm -hmm. to the code, right, making it open, and then? deciding to really pursue this and actively manage the community and pursue a better product and continually update, was there a point where you decided this is worth investing my time in? And what was that decision? Yeah, so uh, for me it, it was a largely personal decision. Um, the, the code, it was maybe a year, year and a half after we released the code and you know it was, it was useful for i3, the hyperspace where we were using it. Um, and I had uh, just moved to Boston, um, so I had I had left the hackerspace, uh, and it was kind of a way for me to stay involved in the community. Uh, so I wanted a way to contribute if I wasn't there physically, and I saw that this was something that um, you know the the like I three Detroit wouldn't look the way it does now without Seltzer CRM or something like it. Uh, it has almost 200 members, so you know you really need something like that, and it's amazing what they've been able to do with, you know, with so many members and and the space that they have and the tools that they have. So I kind of said, well, this is really, you know, the the best thing that I can put my time into uh, to help kind of I3 Detroit and the hackerspace community in general. Um, and it was also interesting to me. Like it's a fun project to work on. Um, so it, that, it was a really personal decision. It wasn't like... I expect it is for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, so... Yeah. There's that a lot of projects out there, and deciding what you want to put your time and your heart into is... Mm -hmm. and, or we'll just start your own. It's, I only got involved this year with open source because I, I have a project that I just don't care enough about. Right. <laughs> I actually wanted to touch the code base. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's an interesting side topic. Is you know, when do you decide to drop out of a you know open source project? I don't know if you guys have you know been involved in some, and uh, obviously there are you know problems with the personalities, or there's something about the goals that they've set, and you know, is there is there that type of experience in the right? Uh, so you mean to drop out of one that you've started or one that you're participating in? Or? Well, so I, you know, I think the topic is you're leading something right. and now you decide it's not, not what, one you want to lead anymore. Oh, yeah. So the experience that I've had is, um, you know, right now the existing version of Seltzer is kind of in maintenance mode. So like other people are contributing. Uh, I am um, helping them if they have questions. I, answer, I try to answer their questions right away. Um, but I'm, we're not actively doing development right now. Like we're not having the dev meetings. Um, uh, so I kind of made that decision because I had made like I'd hit some milestones uh, in the development that I was happy with, and I had been putting other things on hold for it. And I said, okay, now I'm going to put this on the back burner for a while um, because the the number of developers isn't really growing right now. Um, I'm going to do some other things, and then come back to it, and you know, kind of when I'm fresh, uh, see if we can pull more developers in and and start growing the project again. Um, I haven't I haven't had the experience of starting an open source project and then you know ha passing it off to someone, um, so I can't really say anything about it. Well, okay. So uh, suppose you want to make your project that you're working on. You know, more, more capable in case you are deciding to step away, right? right. So, I mean, how would is there any things that you know, I mean, so with documentation, mm -hmm. mentoring other people, 
you have any you know thoughts on doing that type of work to make it longevity you know yeah that's that's really important um, you know you definitely want to have a, a large bus number um, you know the, the the number of people who um, would have to get hit by a bus for the <laughs> for the uh, project to, to stop stop um, going forward but don't all buy the same lottery ticket right <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um, so uh, <coughs> good I mean it's 